All right, everyone. Uh, welcome to the eighth lecture for Stat 1070 this semester. Um, we have a fair bit to get through today. It's a pretty full lecture, so um, we'll get right into it. Uh, this week we are continuing on from last week where we first talked about um, paired data or independent data, where we have uh, two different samples of numeric data. Um, and we'll, we want to look to see whether there's a difference in those means. Um, so today we're going to be looking at the case where we have independent samples. And then following on from that, we're going to be looking at this testing procedure called ANOVA. Okay, so ANOVA is basically an extension of the independent samples t-test. So in the, in the independent samples t-test, we have two samples of uh, numeric data. Um, and the ANOVA is an extension of that to where we have uh, more than two samples of numeric data. And we're also going to be having a look at um, the post hoc testing procedure for, for ANOVA. All right, so from last week, uh, we introduced the uh, method for testing whether data appears to be normal or whether it appears to come from a normal distribution. And if you remember, we did that by looking at a normal quantile plot or the QQ plot. So we'll see more of those again today. Um, as I mentioned, we looked at the one sample t-test, which was where the scenario that we were dealing with involved inference for a single population mean. So we were testing some claim about a single population mean. Um, and we also looked at doing a confidence interval for that scenario. And then we had a look at the paired paired t-test, uh, which is where we have some data. There's some natural pairing between the two, um, the two samples. And um, rather than look at the samples separately, we create a new data set, which is a sample of differences. And we then just do a one sample t-test on that sample of differences. Um, so just a couple of scenarios here to give people a bit of a refresher on the differences between um, a paired scenario and an independent scenario. So this first scenario, to compare the effect of a new treatment of baldness, 40 pairs of twins were sampled. One twin received the new treatment, the other received the control treatment without the active ingredient. All right, so would people think that that is paired? Yep, a few people nodding. Um, yeah, so I guess in this scenario, we have the fact that the two individuals are twins um, so they, um, they share very similar genetic information, which is, a, is something that is, is a source of variation for baldness as to whether you go bald or not. Um, so they're trying to remove that source of variation by using twins in the study. Um, and studies like this with twins are actually very common. Um, um, I think particularly in psychology. I've been to a few psychology talks where um, they've talked about these big studies where they involve twins in them. Um, whereas the second scenario, so to compare socioeconomic status of partisan voters, a random sample of 50 Liberal supporters and 50 Labor supporters uh, reported their annual income. So here we just have 50 Liberal supporters, 50 Labor supporters. They're two completely different groups of people. There's no information given as to um, any link that, that is between them. Um, so by default, we would just say that those samples are independent. All right, so last lecture, we completed these yellow portions. So, um, and this week we will be completing the hypothesis tests, um, where we have two variables and confidence intervals as well. 
All right, so the first example we're going to look at is um, looking at some tuatara weights. Okay, so we have some two different samples of data which represent the weights of uh, tuataras at two different locations. And we're interested in whether the population mean weight of the lizards um, are the same at each location. And at location A, we trapped 13. Location B, we trapped 7. We've calculated their means um, of group A, mean of group B, and their variances as well. All right, so the question that we're after is, is there a difference in the, in the population mean weights from each location? So as with the previous test we've looked at, the first step is to set up the null and alternative. Now, in the past uh, two tests that we've looked at, we've only had a single population parameter, and we only just had a single mu, uh, whether that was mu subscript d or, um, or just mu, we would call it for the population mean. Whereas here, we've got two different populations, the and we're interested in whether the mean of population A is different to the population mean um, from location B. So in our null and alternative for this test, we're going to have two different population parameters. And the null um, is that they're both equal. So we're just going to assume that the population mean from location A is the same as the population mean weight from location B. Uh, and the alternative here is just um, that they're not equal. All right, so we're just going to do a two-sided test. Now, if we subtract mu B from both sides of this equation, um, we end up with a, a zero on the right-hand side because we have mu B minus mu B is zero. And on the left-hand side, we have mu A minus mu B equals zero. So you can write the null and alternative in two different ways here. Um, and I personally probably prefer this way. Um, and I'll give my reason for that um, in about 15 slides. But it is perfectly fine. All right, so the next step in the hypothesis test is to calculate our test statistic. And what does our test statistic represent? It represents how different is the data to what we expected to observe, um, or what we would have expected to observe if the null hypothesis was true. And Again, just like the previous test statistics we've looked at, it's structured in the same way. We have our estimated difference, or what we've actually observed, our observed difference, minus what we hypothesised the difference to be, and then divided by that standard error of the difference. So this, this calculation of the test statistic it is a little bit um, uglier, let's say. Um, than the previous formulas, um, but it is, it's still, in essence, the same, the same sort of thing. Uh, here we have our observed difference, um, or, or what we've actually observed in our data. This is what we expected to observe, so the top is, the, um, is a measure of how different our data is to what we would have expected to see, and then we're dividing by our standard error to get a relative size of the difference. All right, so in the example that we're looking at, um, our X bar A uh, is just our sample mean from location A. X bar B is our sample mean from location B. The hypothesized difference in the population parameters is zero. Um, so we just substitute zero in there. And the S squared A is our sample variance at location A. S squared B is our sample variance at location B. Um, and N, A and NB are our sample sizes. So if we substitute those numbers in and 
run through the calculation, we end up with a test statistic of 0 0.941. And then again, the next step is, okay, how different um, or how, how big is that test statistic? Um, well, we need to compare that to the null distribution. Okay, so now for this particular test, there's two different ways that we can come up with the, with the null distribution. Um, if we're doing this calculation by hand, then we can calculate our degrees of freedom conservatively as just the minimum between the two sample sizes, minus one. All right. Um, now the more accurate way to calculate the degrees of freedom for the T distribution is this expression here, which if you thought, if you thought that the calculation of the test statistic was ugly, well, I mean, this, this is uglier. Um, and I get that no one wants to calculate this by hand. So this is why we have this, um, this more conservative, easier way to calculate the degrees of freedom if you're, if you're doing it by hand. Um, but as you'll see in SPSS, SPSS won't give you um, this same calculation as you do by hand because it uses this more exact formula, all right? Now, by conservative, what that means is by using the minimum of the two sample sizes minus one as your degrees of freedom, your p-value will always be larger than um, if you use SPSS to calculate your p-value. All right, so um, if the p-value is larger, that means it's harder to reject, um, you need more evidence in your data, you need more of a difference in your data. Um, and that's why um, it's, it, it's more conservative to use the, the by hand calculation. But if you have ac access to SPSS, then you'd obviously use SPSS, all right? So given that we're calculating this by hand, I suppose, um, the two different sample sizes are 13 and 7. Um, so the minimum of those two values is 7 minus 1. So the degrees of freedom we will just use is 6. Okay, so if the null is true, our test statistic should follow a T distribution with 6 degrees of freedom. Um, so that zero is kind of like this zero here. So if you're just purely testing for a difference between location A and location B, then yes, that, that number will be zero because the null will be that mu A minus mu B equals zero. Um, so that's the hypothesized difference. If we're just testing for a pure difference, but it could be that there is some scenario where um, previous, let's say previous studies have indicated that the difference in the population mean weights from location A and location B is 50 grams. Then, well, we can test that. We can set the null up as mu A minus mu B equals 50. All right? And then when calculating our test statistic, we would substitute 50 in here for the hypothesized difference in the population means. Good question. Um, all right, so where were we? The null distribution, so we know what the null distribution is. We can use that distribution to calculate how extreme our test statistic is now. So if we were to draw the null distribution, our test statistic was um, 0 0.941. And 
we are doing a two-tailed test, so we need to look for differences as extreme in both directions. So the, um, the p-value will be the sum of these two areas, um, which is just the same as uh, multiplying one of them by two, because they're both equal. All right, so we end up with a p-value of 0 0.38. Since that p-value is relatively large, we would not reject the null, and therefore there's uh, not enough evidence to suggest that there's a difference in population means between the two locations. All right, so I'm not sure if I if I said it last week, but just in case I didn't. Um, if we're trying to determine whether a situation is paired or independent um, and we have two different sample sizes, then straight away we should know that it's going to be independent. Okay. That said, if the sample sizes are the same, that doesn't mean that it's paired. You need to have a think about whether it's paired or not. All right. Now the reason for that is, is if we were to, um, if we were to write down all the data points in location A, write down all the data points in location B, then the data point at the thirteenth data point in location A, it can't have any natural pairing to the corresponding value in the B column because there's no value there. All right, you can't have a pairing when there's not an equal number of data points to be paired up. All right? And if you think about it, how do you calculate a sample of differences when in one column you've got 13 values and in the other column you've got seven values? You don't have a pair of numbers to calculate a, a sample of differences of from. All right, so that's a little... That's a little trick. If the two sample sizes are different, then straight away you know that they have to be independent samples. All right, and the assumptions um, for the test are that the two samples are independent um, from each of the target populations and that the distributions are either close to normal or that the sample sizes are large enough that we can rely on the central limit theorem. So basically the assumptions that we need to check are the exact same assumptions as for the one sample t-test, just applied to each of those samples. And as we looked at last week to test the normality assumption, um, we can use the normal QQ plot, or if the uh, Sample size is large, then we can call on the central limit theorem. But in this case, we had n was 13 and 7, I think, so both less than 30. So we'd have to look at a QQ plot, and both of these Q, QQ plots look fine. These points are fairly you know, randomly scattered around that straight line. There's no obvious patterns. Um, so that assumption is met, and for the independence assumption, we're told we were told that the, um, the two Ataras were randomly sampled. All right. Now, how does someone randomly sample two Ataras from the wild? I don't know. I mean, realistically, I don't know how many lizards there are in some location, but. Um, I, would imagine, I mean, to randomly sample them, they would have to select some from a pile and then sort of say, OK, we're going to randomly select from this pile. Um, maybe they just caught all the lazy lizards, in which case, you know, they might not be independent. I'm sure scientists uh, and ecologists have methods for ensuring that the samples they take are, are random, but that's, you know, something to... Keep in mind. All right, so in summary, just like the other tests we've looked at, um, we've got the, the null and alternative, the test statistic, that we then look at uh, determining the null distribution, 
Uh, and then we calculate our p-value, which is done differently depending on whether we're doing a one-sided or a two-sided test. Um, and then our assumptions are basically the same as for a one-sample t-test. All right, so in SPSS, uh, in order to do the um, one-sample t-test, we go analyze, compare means. Um, I've actually got the data set here. So if we go analyze, compare means, independent samples t-test, and then we come to another, um, another screen. So the test variable here, this is the thing that we're testing, so they're, they're weights. Uh, so we go next. Uh, and then the grouping variable, this is the thing that uh, sort of separates the weights into the different groups. So we've got A and B. So if we put island in there, and then we have to go to define groups to tell it what are the values of that variable that define each of the groups. So this is A and B, continue, OK. And then we end up with our output. Might make that a little bit bigger. Hopefully this works. All right, now in SPSS, when we get our output, uh, we have two different rows, okay? We have this equal variance is assumed and then this equal variance is not assumed. So when doing an independent samples t-test, um, in this course, we will be looking at the equal variance is not assumed row. All right, I guess the less you assume, the better. Um, so if we don't assume the variances between each of the groups uh, are the same, then we use this bottom row here. And we can see we have our T, um, our test statistic under T, the degrees of freedom of 17.351. So again, that's different to the degrees of freedom that we used uh, because SPSS uses that um, more complicated calculation. And then we get our SIG two-tailed, which is our p-value. Um, so again, this is going to be different to the p-value we calculated because um, SPSS uses a different null distribution. It's still fairly similar. I think it was 0 0.38 or something. Uh, so again, we're going to uh, come to the same conclusion. We're going to not reject the null in both cases. All right, so um, this is just about the equal variance is not assumed row. So um, the equal variances assumed row um, is equivalent to the testing procedure that we'll see in the second half of the lecture, um, looking at ANOVA, where we only have two groups in the, um, in the ANOVA. In which case, if you only have two groups, you should probably do an independent samples t-test as opposed to an ANOVA anyway. All right, so again, as with the previous tests we've looked at, we can either do the hypothesis test or we can have a look at calculating a confidence interval. Now, the confidence interval for the independent samples scenario um, is the same as the confidence intervals we've looked at in the past. It is our um, point estimate here, point estimate of the difference, plus or minus some multiplier times the standard error of the difference. So you can see this standard error of the difference, uh, this square root of the um, variance divided by the sample size plus the variance of 
the second group divided by the sample size. Um, that's the same as what we saw earlier when calculating the test statistic. All right, this was the um, the denominator in the test statistic. And the T star calculation, um, just to remind people. Just to remind people, the way that we calculate that T star value, because um, in the past this is often something that people struggle with. Uh, if we're doing a 95% confidence interval, then we need to know what the null distribution is. Draw that null distribution um, here, given if, if we're calculating this by hand, we were looking at a T distribution with six degrees of freedom. Um, the sample size in location A was 13, location B was seven. Uh, the minimum of those is seven, minus one is six. So we have a T distribution with six degrees of freedom. And if we're doing, say, a 95% confidence interval, then 95, we look at the values of minus T star to T star that enclose that middle 95% of values. All right? And I guess from this, we remember that um, if the middle area is 95%, there's 5% left over. So there must be 25 in the left tail and 2.5% in the right tail. All right, and then we can use. Um, either stat star or we might be able to find some probability statement like the probability that T6 is less than some number, and that's the number that we're actually after, equals 0 0.025. All right, now this statement here corresponds with that area in the left-hand tail. Or another statement that we might see is the probability that T6 is less than some number here, and that's the number that we want, that's our T star value, is equal to 0 0.975. Okay, now this statement corresponds to this shaded area here. This left-hand tail and the middle part, the 2.5% plus this 95%. All right, so that's just a reminder on how we get that T-star value um, in order to calculate the confidence interval. So here we need to calculate a 95% confidence interval for the difference in um, population mean weights at the two locations. So if we substitute in the values that we had for the sample means, um, our T star multiplier here, if we were to use stat star, um, is 2.447. And the calculation of the standard error is performed here on the right. And we end up with an interval from minus 107.1 to 241.1 grams. So what does that mean? That means that we can be 95% confident that the difference in population means between the two locations lies somewhere between these two values. So if there's a difference between the two locations, that's equivalent to checking whether zero is inside this interval or not. All right, and that's 
That's the reason why I like to write the null as mu a minus mu b equals zero, because then that's a bit of a reminder, okay, zero, that's the number that I need to check whether it's inside a confidence interval or not. Now, as I mentioned that other example, if someone was wanting us to test whether the difference in population mean weights of the two locations was 50 grams, then of course, equivalently, we could check to see whether 50 was inside this interval or not as well. All right? The null in that case would be that mu a minus mu b was equal to 50. And that kind of, you know, having that 50 on the right hand side says, okay, that's the value if I'm doing a confidence interval test to, to check whether that's inside the interval or not. So, since zero is inside this interval, what does that mean? Well, it's equivalent of not rejecting the null hypothesis, yeah. So we would not be able to reject the claim that the, popu that the, um, the population mean weights are equal. All right, the, the we are 95% confident. Um, well, the data is consistent with the population means being equal. All right, does anyone have any questions about the two sample t test? independent samples t-test. Um, I feel like we kind of went through it pretty quickly, but um, we do have a bit to get through, that's all. Um, so we have another example to go through. Here we have a scenario where we've got uh, 20 randomly selected individuals um, they're placed into, or they're classified as two groups, two different groups of people, one group that regularly exercise and one group that do not regularly exercise, um, and their pulses have, or pulse rates have been measured. And we want to know whether the pulse rates for um, people who regularly exercise, whether that is lower than the pulse rates for people who do not regularly exercise, all right? And we're also interested in calculating a 95% confidence interval, all right? So the information that we have is that X bar, so the mean for those that regularly exercise is, is about 65. The mean for those that do not regularly exercise is 72. Uh, the sample standard deviations uh, 7.487, 9.134, uh, and the sample sizes are 12 and 8. So straight away, sample sizes are different. We know that this can't be a paired scenario, um, and we're going to do an independent samples test. So, let's have a look. So, Here's the information from the question. Um, I was going to write this out, but I'll just, I'll just run over this one I prepared earlier. Um, so the first step, writing the null and alternative. All right, so the null is going to be that mu A equals mu B, or you can call these mu um, reg, mu not, whatever. Um, I'm happy with just letting them be A and B. And the alternative is that mu A is less than mu B, all right? So it's important to recognise here that um, the, we're doing a, uh, a one-tailed test um, because we're checking to see if there's evidence that those who regularly exercise have lower pulse rates than those who do not. 
So it's important to recognise that mu A represents the population mean for those who reg regularly exercise. So in this case, it's probably worthwhile noting A represents those that exercise regularly. All right, because I guess if we don't know which one is mu A or mu B, or, or if, if, if it's not clear which group is what, well then we don't really know how that all, whether that alternative is, is set up right. Okay, so A represents those that reg regularly exercise, so yes, mu A is less than mu B is the correct alternative for this situation. Then we've got our calculation of the test statistic. Um, so if we substitute in our mean of group A, mean of group B, um, the standard deviation. Now we have to remember that the formula here is for includes the variance or the standard deviation squared. So you have to remember that if we're, if we're given the standard deviation, you, you have to square that. Um, and then we've got the sample sizes on the denominators here. Um, for each group. This gives us a test statistic of minus 1.716. So based on that test statistic, do people think we're going to reject? Hands up for reject. Anyone think we're going to not reject? A couple of people were a bit going to put their hand up and then we're a bit gun shy. It's I was just interested whether what people thought. I've got a feeling that we're not going to reject, but I've done the question. Um, no, I mean, I, I normally, I normally think, okay, is the number around two? You know, if it's if it's going to be bigger than two, that means we're probably going to reject. All right. If it's if it's obviously closer to zero, well, then we're probably not going to reject. But again, it depends on the degrees of freedom in the T distribution that you're dealing with. So you've always got to continue on, obviously, and, and compare that to the null distribution. Um, all right, so our null distribution, we've got our two sample sizes, 12 and 8. Um, the lesser of those is obviously 8. So 8 minus 1 is 7. So our degrees of freedom is 7. And... So if we, draw, if we draw our null distribution, we have our test statistic here. Um, and the p-value is the area lower than that uh, test statistic. And the reason for that is, is that um, the alternative is that mu a is less than mu b. So that means we're interested in the area in the lower tail. Um, and to calculate that, I just used Statstar. Uh, so we get a p-value of 0 0.04, or sorry, 0649. And then that's probably, that's a, I don't know. Is it low? Is it not low? Um, with with if you're net, if you're not given a, a significance level to compare it to, well then you need to think about okay, what are the consequences of incorrectly rejecting? Right? What are the consequences of, of making a type one error? All right. If you work for um, the CSIRO or you know for the government, and this is going to affect government policy, then that p-value is probably not low enough in order to be able to reject. But if you're just looking at this out of interest and you're not, you know, and then in 20 minutes later you're going to get on with the rest of your life, well then you might be happy to conclude, yeah, okay, well, there's a difference between um, heart rates of 
those that regularly exercise and those that do not regularly exercise. There could very well be a difference. It's just that we don't have enough data to be able to identify that. All right? If we had more data, we might have more information, which would potentially lead to a lower p-value. All right, and then for the confidence interval, I've just shown here the formula for the confidence interval and then calculate it because I thought I would, uh, I would just show how we um, get these numbers using SPSS. So I've, I've got the pulse data set. Uh, so this is the data set. If we go to analyze, compare means, independent samples t-test, the pulse rate is our test variable. That's what we're interested in. Um, exercise is our grouping variable. And you can see they're um, separated or they're classified as either a one or a two. Um, so we've got to define our groups as group one is one, group two is two. Um, and what that does, it looks at the difference of group one minus group two. Um, and you can see here, group one is the one that had more, more people in it. So that's in line with what was done in the slides. Um, so if we go continue, okay. And if we look at the output, let's make this bigger again. All right, so looking at the, um, the output, equal variance is not assumed row. Um, we've got a test statistic of minus 1.716. Uh, our degrees of freedom are 13.01. Now, we have to remember that in SPSS, the p-value which they provide is a two-tailed p-value. Okay, now they provide that reminder here in the in the heading, so sig two-tailed. So this is the, this is the two-tailed p-value. We only want a one-tailed p-value, so we need to divide this amount by two. All right, so the p-value we would get um, by using SPSS um, is 0 0.055, and which is still similar to the p-value we calculated by hand. Um, and we also have our confidence interval for the difference here. So from minus 15.1 to 1.727. All right, so using the confidence interval, um, in order to check whether there's a difference, uh, we would check to see if zero is inside this interval. Zero is inside this interval, so we don't have enough evidence to reject the claim that there is a difference between the population means. Does anyone have any questions? Didn't we have seven degrees of freedom? And that's just 13? Yeah, so if you remember, we had on the earlier slides, we had that really disgusting formula that SPSS uses to calculate the degrees of freedom. So it has a better, more accurate way. Um, so that's why we have a, a different number here. Um, whereas if we do it by hand, we can just do NA, the minimum of NA and NB minus one. Yeah. So yeah, you will get a different you will get a, a different null distribution by using SPSS, um, and if you can, you obviously are better off using SPSS. You can see we've got a lower p-value using SPSS, which means we're more likely to be able to reject the null. Um, and that's because this calculation of the degrees of freedom is more accurate and we have more, more power. So, yep. Um, what does equal variance assumed actually mean? So equal variance is assumed and equal variance is not assumed. So that's just saying we've got group A and group B. Um, the equal variance is assumed 
basically says, okay, let's assume the population variance in group A is equal to the population variance in group B. Whereas the equal variance is not assumed row is saying, don't make that assumption. All right, the, the, the population variance for group A is allowed to be different to the population variance for group B. Anyone have any other questions? All right, well, in that case, let's have a break. Um, let's have a nine-minute break, um, and we'll have a look at ANOVA in the second half. <laughs>
All right, everyone. Let's um, let's continue. So now we're going to be having a look at a procedure called ANOVA. All right, which is um, short for, I guess, um, analysis of variance. And as you would expect, a testing procedure called analysis of variance is actually um, testing for means. Um, does that make sense? No, it doesn't. Um, all right, when I first learned about ANOVA, I did not understand why it was called analysis of variance. When we're interested in means, that didn't make sense to me. And it was because when I first ever learnt this topic, I wasn't shown the pictures on the next couple of slides. Um, so let's have a look at them. All right, so if we look at these two different, or three different box plots, um, so, as I said at the start, this testing procedure is an, extens an extension of the two sample t-tests, all right? If we weren't interested in C at all, we only cared about A and B, um, and we had some numerical data from A and B, then we would just do a two sample t-test. Now, if we've got three or more groups, um, then we obviously can't do a two sample t-test. We need to um, use this testing procedure called analysis of variance. Now looking at this slide, um, the black line on here represents the median, um, but let's just pretend it's the mean. Um, given that the distributions are fairly symmetric, the mean and the median are going to be very close to each other. So looking at these, does it look like the means for these groups are different. All right, here's our actual sample means. Um, so the mean of the group A and group B and group C are 30, 29, and 28. So I don't know about you, but to me, they don't look all that different. All right. Now, if we have a look at this second slide, now it looks like, okay, it does look like there's a difference between the means or those where the locations of those black lines are for group A, group B, and group C. All right, now the actual means, again, are the same. It's just that it looks like there's a bigger difference because the variance or the width of these box plots has got narrower. Okay? So if we look at it here, if we look at the if we look at the width of those box plots, they run from about 80 to minus 20 for the for the orange one. Uh, and this one here is about 65 to minus 15. So the box plots are very wide compared to how different the means are. All right. Whereas if we look at the next slide, if we think about it the other way, the difference between each of these means is bigger relative to the total variation in each of the groups. Does that make sense? All right, so that's, that's the reason why when you look at this picture, it looks like those means are, are different. It's because the variation from um, black line to black line to black line is relatively big compared to the variation in each of the whole box plots. All right, whereas if we look at this previous plot, the variation from black line to black line is really small compared to the overall variation in each of the box plots. All right, so if, if you can see that and you think, okay, yep, that makes sense, well, that's what the ANOVA testing procedure does. It compares 
the variance of these black lines. So how much variability is there from, from um, mean to mean in each of the groups? How much variability is there there compared to the variability overall in each of the groups? Okay, that's, that's what the analysis of variance testing procedure does. All right, so we'll have a look at the we'll have a look at the details of that, um, and before we do that, we'll have a look at a summary of the actual ANOVA testing. So um, a little bit different, I guess. We'll look at this first, and then we'll have a look at the the details of the test. So for the analysis of variance, there's a couple of slides coming up where there's some calculations on it where you don't have to worry about making these calculations yourself. They're, they're, these are just shown to um, demonstrate how the testing procedure works. I wouldn't expect anyone to have to make those calculations themselves, so I will remind you of that and you can just sit back and relax for those couple of slides. Enjoy the show. Um, oh, all right, so the, again, with all the other tests we've looked at, structured the exact same way, uh, the null and alternative. Now, in this case, we're testing whether the means in each of the groups um, are all the same. So here we're going to have mu1 equals mu2 equals mu all the way up to mu k, if we've got k groups. And the alternative is that at least one pair of means is different. Okay, so... Um, I will write this down because people make this mistake quite often. So in an ANOVA, let's say we've got three, three groups. So it's mu1 equals mu2 equals mu3. All right, that's our null. That the population mean from group one is equal to the population mean of group two is equal to the population mean of group three. The alternative, as it was written, is that mu i doesn't equal mu j for one pair i and j, um, something like that. This is not what the alternative is, okay? All right, this is not the alternative. This, this is saying that mu1 doesn't equal mu2 and mu2 doesn't equal mu3. All right. What the actual alternative is, if we wanted to expand this out, it is something like <coughs> mu1 doesn't equal mu2 or mu1 maybe doesn't equal mu3, or mu2 doesn't equal mu3. All right, we only need one pair, or at least one pair of means to not be equal in order to be able to reject the null, okay? Whereas this statement, this is a much stronger statement. This is saying that they're all different. Okay, so um, seeing as I've made a point of that, a big point of that, hopefully no one will make that mistake. Um, because that is a very common mistake that people make when setting up the null and alternative. All right, so the alternative, um, I mean, if you weren't comfortable with writing these subscript I's and J's, you could probably write something like at least one pair of population means are different. Um, that's, that's probably fine as well. All right, now our test statistic is going to be F. We're going to call it F. Um, and this equals the mean square group divided by the mean square error. Okay, 
and what the mean square group and mean square error are, they are they represent the mean square group represents the amount of variation in those black lines on those previous plots, and the mean square error represents the amount of variation in, in those in those box plots. Okay, so um, when the variation from box from black line to black line is big compared to the sort of average variation in each of these boxes, this F number will tend to be bigger. All right? So if the variation from black line to black line is big relative to the variation in those box plots, then this number will be big. We'll have, a, we'll have a bigger number divided by a smaller number. F will be big, and that will tend to lead us to reject the null. All right? But in order to check, obviously, we've got to compare our test statistic to the null distribution. Now, luckily, um, we're reminded of what the null distribution will be, given our test statistic is called F. It's going to be a... F distribution, all right? And the thing about the F distribution is that it has two different degrees of freedom, all right? So this is another common mistake that I see when people write the, um, they write down what the null distribution is, is they only include one of the degrees of freedom, all right? So remember for the F distribution, there are two degrees of freedom, two separate degrees of freedom that you need to note. Um, and they are k minus 1, where k is the number of groups. So if we were dealing with three, three different groups, um, the first degree of freedom would be 2, and n minus k is the um, total number of samples minus the number of groups. All right? Now, for the p-value, we only care about... Um, values more extreme than our test statistic to the right, all right? And I'll, we'll see that on the, on the next line. But we don't have to worry about doing any one-tailed or, or two-tailed tests here, okay? So we're just looking for the area on the right-hand side of the test statistic in this scenario. And the assumptions for the ANOVA... Um, are that we have independent observations, which we've had in all of our tests. The second assumption is that the variance in each of the populations is equal. And we will have a look at a, a way that we can test that assumption. Um, and similarly to the other testing procedures we've looked at, we need that the um, either each of the populations or each of the groups um, are normally distributed or they come from a normal distribution or that the sample sizes are large enough, i.e. greater than 30, and then we can rely on, on the central limit theorem. So we've got an example to look at, looking at some wombats. Um, so we've got three different species of wombats. Uh, common, we've got the northern hairy nose and then the southern hairy nose. And we want to know, is there evidence of a difference in the true average weights among the three different species? Okay, so is, is there a difference in the population mean weight of common uh, hairy nose and southern hairy nosed wombats? All right, so some information that we have. We're told that the means of each of the groups, we're told the variances for each of the groups, um, and the sample sizes in each group was, was six. All right, so as we've talked about, the null will be that each of those population means are equal. All right, so we're going to assume that um, the population means are equal. 
So mu c equals mu n equals mu s, and then our alternative will be that at least two mu i's are different, or you, I prefer to say at least one pair of means is different. Um, you can write whatever, you, whatever you're comfortable with. Um, yeah, as we've got here, we've just got a reminder here that the, the alternative is not that mu c does not equal mu n does not equal mu s. Okay, we only, we're looking to detect that at least one of them, at least one pair is different. All right, so if we remember on the summary slide, the calculation of the test statistic was that F equaled mean square group divided by mean square error. Okay, so this is how the mean square error is calculated. All right, and this is, you don't need to know how to perform this calculation, um, but let's have a look at what this calculation is, all right? So these are S squared, these are the variances in each of the groups. And effectively what we're doing here is we're taking a weighted average, weighting based on the sample size in each of the groups. Um, in this case, the sample sizes are all equal, um, so they all get an equal weighting. Um, but we're basic, basically just looking at the average variance across the three groups. Okay, so if we look at, if we go back to the numbers here, these were the variances for each of the groups. And then here, we're just multiplying each of the variances by the, roughly the number we have in, in that group, and then dividing by n minus k to get an average variance, okay? So thinking back to the box plot, what does this represent? This represents a measure of how wide, on average, each of those box plots are, okay? Now, the mean square group, if we have a look at what this calculation is, and again, this is one that you, you don't have to worry about writing anything down, you don't have to make this calculation yourself. Here we're looking at the, the difference in each group's mean with the grand mean, all right? So here we're trying to get a measure of the, the variance or the variation of those black lines, all right? How much variation is there um, between those black lines in, in each of the groups? Um, and this formula is basically the, the same formula as used for calculating the variance. It's the difference between some number and the mean, squared, sum them all up and then divide by n minus one. In this case, it's k minus one because we've got k, k groups. All right, so this gives us a, a, a measure of how much variation there is from black line in between those black lines, all right? So if we have a look at this picture here, um, this is the original data. So we've got the, this orange group here, this green group, um, the purple group, and this X bar bar, this is the average across all of the samples, all right? So there was six of them, so six in each group, there's 18 in total, that, that's just the, the global average across all 16 of them. So here, we're looking at the mean square group, if you think that means that's talking about those black lines. Here we're looking at how much variation is there from each of the means. In each, how, much, how spread out are each of these group means? All right. 
And we want to compare that to, on average, how spread out the total of these groups are. Okay, so again, that's sort of looking at those, the, the widths of those box plots. And that is what these two calculations take into account. All right, this mean square group, this calculation is measuring the variability um, of, the, of the means or of the sample means in each group. And this mean square error is looking at the sort of total, um, the total variation, the total variation in those um, box plots. So if the null is true, so if those means are equal, then the mean square group divided by the mean square error should give a pretty small number. All right, so let's, again, let's come back to this picture. If we look at how much variation is there from black line to black line, that is small compared to how spread out the box plots are. So the variation here divided by this big variation is a small number. And looking at this plot, this indicates that, well, there's probably not a difference. We probably can't recognise that there's a difference there. Whereas in this picture, we're hopefully we're happy that it's a little bit more obvious that there is a difference between these means. The variation from um, between these means is quite high compared to this variation um, in the groups overall. And then so when we calculate that F statistic, we get a number that is some sort of relative measure of how different those measures of, of, of variation are. Okay. So from the test statistic, we can compare that to the null distribution and get an idea on whether we should be rejecting the null or not. So the F distribution, um, we haven't, haven't looked at. But the F distribution is a strictly positive distribution. Um, it's skewed to the right. Um, and you can see here for different degrees of freedom how the, the shape of that distribution changes. Um, so in our case, we had three different groups. So the first degree of freedom is going to be two, which is K minus one. And we had um, 18 measurements in total. So the second degree of freedom is going to be n minus k. 18 minus 3 is 15. So when we draw, uh, when we draw this F distribution, same as we've done in the, um, you know, in all the other examples. Um, we just draw the distribution, we mark on where the test statistic is, and then for the analysis of variance, we're only interested in the area to the right. All right? And unfortunately, we can't calculate that by hand, so we would have to use um, Statstar or SPSS and we would end up getting a p-value of 0 0.044. All right, so is that a small p-value? Well, it's, you know, it's less than that magic, but not magic, 0 0.05. Um, so we may consider this as being enough evidence to reject the null um, and conclude that at least one pair of wombat means are different. Does anyone have any questions? Uh, when you, sorry, back to this slide. When you were saying about the um, F statistic. Yep. Uh, 
Yes? Well, okay, so as in all of these tests, what is a small number, what is a big number, the only way to, to really work that out is to compare it to the null distribution. So in this case, 3.859, I mean, that is a, that's not a very big number compared to some numbers that I, I can think of, but um, we have to look at how big it is relative to the, to the null distribution, and if we look at the, the null distribution, um, how big is it? Well, we get a small p-value, so it is pretty big. All right. So, I mean, you shouldn't read too much into the test statistic. The test statistic just gets calculated as a way to then go and calculate the p-value. The p-value is what you want to base your decision on all the time. All right. So. Um, that said, um, an F ratio, if, if the null is true, you would expect an F ratio of somewhere around 1. All right, so values bigger than 1, that's indicating that we might be able to reject the null. Um, does someone else have another question? All right, so in terms of um, the analysis of variance test, the calculations that get performed in an ANOVA um, generally get summarised in an ANOVA table. Now, um, these ANOVA tables are all structured in the same way. All software produces them um, in the same sort of way. Some might have more rows than others, but... Um, they're still structured in this in the same sort of way. So it is important that you do understand this ANOVA table and how these calculations here are made, okay? So these um, sum of squared group and sum of squared errors and sum of squares total, these values under this sum of squares, you don't have to worry about performing any calculation like that. Um, but you do need to recognise, okay, the degrees of freedom for group will be K minus 1. The degrees of freedom for error um, will be N minus K, um, leading to a total degrees of freedom of N minus 1. And then you do need to be able to recognise that the, um, the mean square, so this mean square group is calculated as the SSG divided by the degrees of freedom, um, the mean square error is the sum of squared errors divided by the, the relevant degrees of freedom. The F statistic is then calculated as um, that ratio, and then we have the p-value um, from that F, F statistic. So in the Wombat example, um, if you were provided with say this much of the table, I would expect, sorry, and when I say this much, I mean that this, these coloured areas are not there, um, I would expect that you'd be able to calculate the rest of the table. All right, so here, calculating these mean squares, it's just a case of dividing by the degrees of freedom, dividing this sum of square numbers um, by the degrees of freedom. The F statistic is then just going to be the ratio of those mean square numbers, um, and then the p-value we'd have to use SPSS or um, Statstar to calculate that p-value. All right, so in SPSS, I, I've got the Wombats example. Um, so if we go analyze, and then for this we go you can go to compare means one way ANOVA, um, but it's better if you go um, general linear model, univariate, um, and then the dependent variable is going to be weight, the fixed factor, so the factor that affects um, the 
the potential difference in population mean weights. This is going to be our species. And if we go OK, I can come back to it. Um, we end up with our F table. All right, so we end up with our F table, which um, looks pretty similar to the F table. It's got these um, degrees of freedom around the wrong way, but as you can see, uh, the species, so this is our group variable. Um, this is normally the row that we're going to be interested in. This is where we can see our <laughs> F statistic and our P value. All right, so we don't really need to look at these first two rows. Um, the, the species row and the error row are the ones that we've sort of looked at over here. All right, so that's what, that's what it looks like when you don't zoom in so much. Uh, sorry, you don't make the font so big. Um, and then, yeah, so these green rows are the ones that we're interested in. All right, anyone have any questions about that? All right, well, now, now we are going to have a look at... Um, a couple of slides for how we test the assumptions for the ANOVA. All right. So, if you remember, the ANOVA had a couple of um, a couple of extra, uh, or had one extra, had testing the whether the population variances are equal across the groups. Um, but we also need to check whether the uh, the data comes from a normal distribution. And the easiest way to do that is to check the residuals for the model. All right, so conceptually, the way that ANOVA works is it fits a model. All right, and that model says, okay, we have some data. We're going to have our model that explains the variation in that data and then we're going to have some leftover scatter. We're going to have some leftover residuals, some leftover unexplained variation. All right? And so the way we write that for the ANOVA model is that our data point is equal to the mean of the group that it comes from plus some scatter. All right? So if we wanted to make a prediction in the wombat example, if we wanted to predict what the um, what the weight of a wombat might be, well, what's one way we might do it? We might say, okay, that's a northern hairy-nosed wombat. The mean of northern hairy-nosed wombats is 80. So I'm going to predict that the the weight of a of a new hairy-nosed wombat would be 80. All right, that, that's a pretty sort of obvious way to guess what the, um, what the mean weight of a, of a new wombat would be is you take into account the group that it comes from. Okay, and that's, that's all this is saying here, all right? So a data point, we're going to say is equal to the mean of the group that it comes from plus some random scatter because it's, it's, it's never going to be perfect, all right? And the ANOVA model assumes that this random scatter is normally distributed with a mean of zero and a variance of sigma squared. Okay? And we assume that the variance is equal across each of the groups. All right? that's, that's one of the assumptions that we, that we talked about on the earlier slide. So checking whether the variances in each of the groups are equal, we can do another 
hypothesis test. Okay, so for this particular test, we kind of we don't mind if you take a bit of a shortcut on it, um, but the important thing to recognise for this particular test, the null, is that the population variances are all equal. All right, and we perform the test. Let's come back over here. Um, analyze general linear model univariate. Let's go save unstandardized residuals. This is for something that we're going to do in a couple of slides. But we can go options and we can tick homogeneity tests. So this is testing for whether the variances in each of the groups are equal. We go OK. And now when we run the, uh, the ANOVA, we get this Levine's test of equality of variances. Okay, now if you're using a newer version, this might be um, this might be version 24 or something of SPSS um, version. The newer newer version has a number of rows here, um, but it's all um, it still should give the exact same numbers. And we have a look at this sig value, which is our p value. So. Let's think about the test. The test is the null is that the population variances are all equal. Our p-value is relatively big, 0 0.9. So we can't reject the null. People happy with that? P-value is large. We can't reject the null. The null was that the variances are all equal. We can't reject that. So that indicates that this assumption, the assumption for the test has been met. We don't have evidence to say that the assumption um, ha has been violated. All right. So looking at the looking at the p-value for Levine's test, we can't reject the null. Um, we're even reminded here that it tests the null hypothesis that the error variance um, is equal across groups. So we can't reject that null. Therefore, we can't reject. Um, that the assumption has been met. All right, so the p-value is large, we've got no reason to reject that assumption. Now, in order to check for normality, we need to have a look at um, have a look at the residuals. So the residuals in this case, um, now in all different sorts of models there, there's different um, definitions of residuals, but for the ANOVA model, the residuals are just the particular data point we have, and let's say that's from group A, minus the mean of group A. All right, so it's just the difference between what we would predict, what we would predict for that value, and what we actually observed for that value. Um, so, let's say the mean of the common wombats was um, 80, um, but a particular value um, in that group was 82 then the residual that corresponds to that value would just be 82 minus the 80 minus the mean for the group that that came from, um, and we'd have a residual of 2. All right. So for each of the groups, we're going to have residuals that are scattered around 0, um, and we need to check whether they come from a normal distribution. So as I did, um, if we go save in the... Um, analyze general linear model univariate section. Um, we can tick the box for unstandardized residuals. And then hopefully, if we have a look at our um, data set, there'll be a new column now with the residuals saved. And so for group one, you can see that these values 
are all scattered around zero. Um, these values as well, these are the ones from group three, group two, sorry. Um, so, how do we check whether these residuals are normally distributed or not? Then we need to do a QQ plot. So we can go analyze, descriptives, explore. Then we can put the dependent variable as the residuals. And under the factor, we can break it up by the different species. And then options, nope, plots, normality plots with tests. And then after this is run, we get our QQ plots. So this is the QQ plot for the common um, common wombat. This is the QQ plot for the northern hairy nosed and the QQ plot for the southern hairy nosed. So there's no obvious pattern there. I'm happy that they appear to come from a normal distribution. So that assumption for the test um, is, is met. All right, so that's just the process of getting the QQ plots. Now, um, if the sample size is relatively small, as it is in this case, there's only six in each group, um, it's also okay to just do a QQ plot of them all combined. All right, don't break it out over the different, um, over the different groups. Now, if the sample size um, in each of the groups was, I don't know, 20, 30, well then you definitely should do them, do those plots separately, okay? And uh, check whether each of the group's residuals are normally distributed or not. Or not. Anyone have any questions before we move on? All right. Okay, so what have we done? What have we done? We looked at this ANOVA testing procedure, which basically looks at how different is the variation in these means compared to this overall variation. Um, we looked at some wombats, we got a p-value of 0.044, so we rejected the null, and we're saying that there is a difference in at least one pair of means. All right. So at least one, uh, at least one lot of mu i and mu j are different. Now. That doesn't tell us a whole lot. That's not, that's not all that exciting. So when we reject the null, when we say, OK, there is one pair of means that are different here, well, then we can say, OK, well, let's keep digging and let's find what means are actually different. All right. So the ANOVA testing procedure doesn't tell you where the differences are. It just tells you that there is a difference. All right. If you do reject the null and you do find that there is a difference in uh, one pair of means, or at least one pair of means, then we can move on and do this ANOVA post hoc testing. Okay, so in the scenario that we were looking at with the wombats, there are three different pairwise combinations that we can look at. All right, we can look at a difference between common and southern common and northern, and then uh, southern and northern. Okay, so there's three different combinations. Now, one might think, okay, well then why don't we just do three separate t-tests? 
all right, why don't we just do three separate independent samples t-tests for each of these combinations, all right? That would be a, a reasonable suggestion. The only problem with that is, is that we can artificially inflate our risk of making a type one error, okay? So what's a type one error? A type one error is where we incorrectly reject the null, all right? If we're doing a test and we have a 5% significance level, then that means that 5% of the time, if we do that test in the long run, we will make a type one error, okay? So that means 95% of the time, we will not make a type one error, all right? And that's, that's pretty good. Now, if we're gonna do three different t-tests, then across those three, the probability of making at least one type one error is equal to one minus 0 0.95 cubed, all right? Because the probability of not making a type one error in the first test is 0 0.95, probability of not making a type one error in the second is 0 0.95, in the third is 0 0.95, so the probability of not making a type one error in all three is 0.95 cubed. So the probability of making at least one type one error is going to be one minus that, that amount. All right, so there would be, we would be doing tests using a 5% significance level and yet we would be taking on a 14.3% type one error rate. And that's, that's not what we want. We want our significance level and our type one error rate to be aligned. So the way we get around that is a testing procedure called Tukey's HSD. All right. And let's just have a look at that. So let's go analyze, general linear model, univariate. Then we have this post hoc tab. So under post hoc, if we put species over to the right here, we can then tick Tukey. All right, now there's lots of different sorts of post hoc tests. We're just gonna focus on Tukey in this course. Um, so continue, okay. And then now, when we run the ANOVA, we get some um, post hoc output and there's two different lots of output here, and in total there's three different ways to look for a difference um, in the groups. And you can use any one that you think is um, easiest. So let's... So here, this is the, the first one that comes out. This is the multiple comparisons. So here on this first um, area of the table, we've got a comparison of common to northern and common to southern. Here we have the mean difference. So this is the difference in the means for those groups. And here we have a column of significance levels. So we basically interpret this column of significance levels, not significance levels, p-values, just like p-values as if we were doing a, a, any test any um, t-test, say. So in all of these comparisons, except this one here, the p-value is greater than, say, 0.05. When we look at northern hairy-nosed compared to southern hairy-nosed, we have a p-value of 0.04. That indicates that we have enough evidence to suggest that, there, that there's a difference between the northern and southern hairy nose wombat weights. All right, and then of course, this is repeated um, because here we have the other comparison, southern to northern, all right? Obviously comparing northern to southern is the same as comparing, uh, southern to northern is the same as northern to southern. Um, 
And on the right hand side, we also have some confidence intervals for the difference. So if, if you're more happy with using confidence intervals than using the p-value, here we can check to see if zero is inside those confidence intervals. Here you can see zero is inside the interval for all of them, except for the one where we've actually identified a difference um, between those two groups. All right, so that's using the multiple comparisons table. The other table is the um, homogeneous subsets table. So here you can just look to see are there any um, group names that are completely separated. All right, so here we've got common is the common um, wombat is in subset one and two, whereas the northern is only in subset two, the southern is in subset one, so the southern and the northern aren't shown in the same subset, that means that we can say that there's a difference there. All right, whereas the common um, is in both subset one and subset two, so we, we wouldn't be able to identify that there's a difference um, between the, the common and the northern, because the northern is also in subset two. The common's in subset one, the southern's also in subset one, so we couldn't identify a difference between the southern and the common. All right, so from the analysis of variance, we were able to identify that there was a difference somewhere. Then doing the post hoc testing, we were then able to find where that difference was, and that difference was between the southern and the northern. Harry knows Wombat. Does anyone have any questions? All right, I can see everyone's done. All right, there was a lot to get through, um, but hopefully it makes your tutorial and lab a little easier, having looked at the ANOVA post hoc testing um, this week. All right, enjoy your week, everyone, and thank you for attending.